I like watching fishing on TV. You ever? That'll make you worry about yourself. You ever watch fishing on TV for like 15 minutes and then just go, boy, I better get a life. I'm watching fishing. I'm not even fishing, I'm watching fishing. Too lazy to fish. I'm taping fishing to watch again later. Come on over, I got a fishing tape. No, a new one. And at the end of the fishing show, they roll credits. There are like 90 people involved with the two guys fishing. What are they all doing? And one of the credits is film editor. This poor guy. He's got to watch all the footage. It's not exciting enough to make it into that final show. Footloose. Let's hear for the boy, Denise Williams, 707 at WRJN Radio. Hometown Radio, refreshed. Rain and snow, less than a half an inch expected today with a height of 37. Drizzle and 36 degrees right now. Derek Ho- Carl. <laughs> I've been practicing this, all practicing this all week. Karwowski. Am I right, Jerry? About right? You're right. Okay. You're right. Good. I got it. I got it. Okay, so um, here in Racine, the city of Racine, uh, just rain. It's just wet. And you're out in Union Grove. What's it like out there? It's just raining. Yeah, just raining. But it raining. was unique. A snowplow comes scratching down the rainy highway here. <laughs> what? I don't get it. Yeah, why would they bother? <laughs> I know. They oh. they do it a lot. Jerry the, is... The guys, the guys want the overtime, I guess. You know, They were just told to plow. They, they yep. just plow what's there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jerry is the owner of uh, Oak Clearing Farm, and that is out at Union Grove. I've been there. And a couple of times a year, they open it up to the public. And it's like the history of Racine from the 1800s on up. And is this just stuff you collected, or is this just happened to be there when you bought the place? No, I, I was collecting uh, Racine objects all the way back to 1970. And I was living in Racine. And then uh, I had this major collection. I It all started with finding some old bottles, and then I, I just grew from there. But uh, in 1988, I moved out to the farm here, and we had this big old barn and an old granary and that, and we just converted it into an open-air-type museum, and it's worked out pretty good. You know, in, in between 88 and 98, I was really busy here. But then in 98, it just kind of drifted off, uh, the school kids, uh, the teachers weren't uh, setting up field trips to come here and that anymore. And uh, so we kind of shut it down for 10 years in 98. But this Packer Frank, a friend of mine, he's passed away now from Union Grove, just kept bugging me and bugging me. you got to open that back up again, Jerry. you got to open it back up again. And I told him, we'll make an agreement. If you become my blacksmith... I will open. And that's what he did. He became my blacksmith in 2008, and he did that job wonderfully until he passed away. And uh, it it was really great. Yeah, uh, 2017 was the big deal with the American Pickers. It, It was an interesting experience. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. I want to talk more about the history of what you've got there. And by the way, Frank Lamping, who you mentioned... Uh, did pass away. He was a big historian for Union Grove. Yep. And and I mentioned to you, this is just a side, uh, he is buried in Union Grove Cemetery, not the Veteran Cemetery, but Union Grove Memorial Cemetery. And I'm my plot is right behind his, about two steps away. So, okay. And you can always find his because he's in the Green Bay Packer Fan Hall of Fame. Yep. And all this Green Bay Packer stuff is all over his gravesite. So he's very easy to spot from a distance. So someday, if you want to visit me, go to his gravesite, take two steps back, four steps to the left, and you'll find me. Anyway, <laughs> just yeah. in case anybody's going to be looking. So 
I went there, I guess I must have gone, I don't know if I went in the spring or fall, but I went there one time. It was very crowded. And you do have a lot of parking on the on the farm. Okay. Yeah. That particular day, yeah. we had over 700 people come through. Yeah, it was crowded. Yeah. There, you know, most people just come through. It takes them 20 minutes, 30 minutes. They just kind of take a walk through. Other people stop and talk with everybody and, and things like that. They spend maybe an hour or something like that. But we had a girl, and uh, Real Racine had a slip that, uh, you know, you had to put down uh, where you're from and how many in your group. And I had a woman that was going around and making sure almost everybody was kind of logged in so we know how many uh, people were, had come. You know, it was kind of cute because I took the slips to Real Racine, and a little while later, Dave Blank uh, uh, called me up and he says, "Can you do this again?" I said, "Well, sure." You know, and then uh, he said, "We had sixty sites open, eleven hundred people signed in at sixty sites." And over 700 is on your sheets. This is amazing. <laughs> and it, it actually was, and it was a real thrill. But they just came out to see the goofy guy in Union Grove that collects stuff. That's no, they came, they, they came to see the history that the goofy guy put together. Is <laughs> <Yeah>. what they, <laughs> and it you, was a fun project. Now, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you, it's you and your wife, Marie, right? Pardon me? You and your wife put this together. Yeah. 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 Now, when I went in, just w walk us through. Give us like a um, a visual tour, an audio tour of what we see when we go through there. And these are barns and buildings we're going through on the property. Give us kind of a walking tour of what we see. Well, now we put in three new displays. And uh, now you'd park in the back lot and you'd go into a fanning mill building. Uh, fanning mills were grain cleaning machines. Racine had about 12 companies that manufactured them, and we have a whole line of these grain cleaning machines and things related to cleaning grain. And that was the Fanning Mill Museum. Then we have another uh, old tools and, and merchandise building full of old uh, hand tools and and all kinds of other different merchandise. You know, that I hung up signs from, like, Snyder's... Uh, uh, variety store on Taylor Avenue and and uh, these different things I hung them on the wall in there and it, it's interesting. Then you go over to the pink house and a pink house is like a pioneer cottage and uh, it has a rope bed, the pot belly stove and the girls are all dressed up in costume and they tell you all the story about the some of the story about the farm, and then you get to see these old things that, you know, pot belly stoves, rope beds, things that you normally don't see every day. And then a walk down the path, you go past this little woodworking shop. That one doesn't have anything going on in it, but it's it's got all kinds of antique tools and, and things also. Then you go to the blacksmith shop. That actually is the anchor the anchor it's it that alone would would uh, be interesting for a person to see because it's a complete blacksmith shop it's like a cadillac it's got everything in it it's it's not a uh put together deal it, it was a whole shop i bought it in 1988 it's lock stock and barrel it took two weeks to move all the equipment and everything over here to the farm and then we readjusted the area to fit it and then uh, this year, or this last year, we added a bottle museum. Finally, the things that started my whole career in local history, I finally put them on display again. And that I have a major collection of Racine bottles and uh, brewery bottles, drugstore bottles, milk bottles, soda bottles, everything you could think of, Dr. Shoup's medicines. And I put uh, about 70% of the collection on display. And, uh, yeah, through the years, it, it's been wonderful. I started this in 1988. You know, we're looking back. That's, that's quite a few years. You know, I, I, I first got involved with the Historical Society, and then I was on the board of trustees and, and the vice president. But then I outgrew it, <laughs> you know. 
and I had all of these things, and then when I moved out to the farm, I had a place to put them. And uh, <clears throat> I continue to buy these things, you know, almost every day I buy something off of eBay. It might just be a matchbook or something from Ray Sheed, but I, you know, I don't know if it's a habit or, or <laughs> a bad vice or whatever, but a couple dollars here and there it doesn't kill me, you know. Well, let me ask you, how, what's the earliest dated piece of artifact or, or item you have there? How far back do you, can you date some of these items? Well, uh, the oldest, uh, one of the oldest, well, I got a prehistoric, a few prehistoric things, you know, related to Indians. But I've, I've got books from the 1600s. Oh, really? Okay. And yeah. the 1600s, 1700s. And uh, we have a... Uh, very good library here and archives. And uh, I started putting this together 50 years ago. I've got 20, uh, 2,500 postcards, 1,000 matchbook covers related, r- related to Racine in Racine County. You know, uh, we have a manuscript file with uh, like old case company catalogs and Harvey Spring catalogs, things like that, old letters, documents. We have uh, letterhead and bill head files of all these different companies all through the years going back to the 1840s. The earliest one in there, I think, is 1841 and uh, or 43. Well, anyways, but, uh, yeah, and... And uh, it's it's been getting cataloged. It's amazing. Uh, I'm getting a catalog. And in our photo collections, uh, I uh, I bought out Home Studio, which was a studio that operated on High Street. And uh, there's thousands of of photographs, mostly portraits. I had initially bought the, the negatives because they were from the early 1900s and he was just playing around with his camera and he took pictures of like uh, Douglas and High Street and churches and schools and fire stations, things like that. But then the lady, I, his daughter, I, I, she says, what about all these other ones? So <laughs> here I bought thousands of negatives from 1916 to 1964. Hold it right there, Jerry. Hold it right there. i got to take a quick break. We're talking to Jerry, okay. Jerry Kowalski of uh, Oak Clearing Farm in Union Grove. More coming up. We're talking about the history of Racine. 719 WRJN Radio. WRJN Radio. Thank you for joining us here on this Tuesday morning. My guest, Jerry Karwowski of Oak Clearing Farm in Union Grove. He's got the history of Racine and the county right at his farm. We're going to talk about how you can go to see it for yourself coming up in just a moment. Plus, we'll talk about American pickers who are out there. But Jerry, you left off about getting some pictures and negatives from the early 1900s. Yeah, that, that was the home studio collection. Well, you know, when I bought that, then I started calling up old photographers, Gus Malmi and, 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 and these different photographers, asking if they had any of them early glass plate negatives and things. And uh, then a, a really cool situation happened. Uh, I went to an antique bottle show up in Milwaukee, and a, a local racine dealer said, Hey, I've got all these glass plate negatives. You should buy them. And at the time, I thought, oh, what would I? I knew nothing about photography, and what would I do with them? You know. And then he, each time I went up there, he bugged me that I should buy them. And then one day I came 
to work, and I was talking to one of the guys at the lunch table, and he says, well, you ought to buy them, you know. I'll show you how to, how to print them out, you know. That's all you need is a light chemicals in a dark room. Oh, okay. So then I bought them. I bought 250 glass plates, and this is from Wilford Marshall. And Wilford Marshall was an amateur photographer that started taking pictures in Racine about 1899. And he, had, he ended up living to be 99 and 10 months old. And he took pictures his entire life here in Racine. But these were early glass plates that he took all around the city of bridges, buildings, hotels, everything you could think of, a lot of groups, family gatherings, and 50th anniversary pictures and things like that. And these are all from like 1900, 1906, 1910, in that time period. Then the next time I went up to the show, he says, oh, you should buy the rest of them. So I ended up buying the rest of them in a thousand glass plates. Now, that was back in 1982, okay? So it took me 41 years, and I finally printed a book with 420 of them glass plates, and it's a beautiful book, Through the Eyes of Wilford Marshall, you know? And uh, it, it's just uh, like a documentation of the city. What It's about him, and, and it has all these beautiful views, 20 mule team Borax teams coming through town. Really? Ships in the harbor. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. And uh, can I tell you where you can buy it? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. in, in Racine, at the, the only place you can buy it in Racine is at the Artist Gallery at 4th and Main. And it, it's also on eBay under, um, you know, it'd be under Through the Eyes of Wilford Marshall. Uh, and, and you hit Racine, and Racine book it probably comes up. You know, I'm not, you know, I love history, and I play with that all the time, but I'm not a good marketer <laughs> or anything like that. Let, but, me tell, let me tell you something. My wife just texted me. She says, I want that book. <laughs> okay, so so one more time. The name of the book is, because I'm going to write it down here, the name of the book is? Through the Eyes of Wilfred Marshall. Through the Eyes of Wilfred Marshall. And it's available at 4th and Main. What was the name of the bookstore again? Artist Gallery. I'm writing this all down. I know what somebody's getting for their birthday. Okay, uh, so she said she wanted that book. And that's got to be magnificent to look through. You 400 of the plates you had made for that book? Yeah. 400. And I mean, they're crystal clear. The pictures in it are mostly five, about five by seven inches. It's a, it's a big coffee table book. Uh, they're crystal clear. And it covers a lot of beautiful things that happened right there right after the turn of the century. You know? And that. But anyways, you know, I'll tell you, this career here, I found some old bottles. Then I'm talking to all my friends about old bottles, right? And somebody says, you should write a book. So, okay, 1976, I start writing a little book on, on Racine bottles, you know, and that. And uh, it, they put a thing in a newspaper that I, I was looking for pictures and things for the book. And uh, so then teachers start calling me up. Could you come and talk about bottles at our class? I, yeah, okay. So I go to these classes at frat school and, and, and uh, take a couple of bottles and talk to the kids about bottles. And then the teacher says, you know, you ought to do a regular program on this, you know? This is really cool, you know? So then I turn around and I get a slide projector. Some friends help me make slides. So I didn't have a camera. You know, a friend took pictures of my, my bottles and that. And then I decided to uh, expand it because I was doing all this research on the book and I was finding all these great historical things, you know, that I had never known about the city and everything. And so I put a slideshow together about the history of Racine. This is in 1979, and, and it was Racine in history and from 1979 well into the 90s and even even almost 2000 i was still doing slide presentations 
of, of you know, the history of Racine. And the neat thing about it was, starting in 79, in 1983 and 84, my calendar, almost every night of the week, I, I had to go and do a church group, a uh, real estate people group, you know, all these different groups, because it was the sesquicentennial year, the 150th <laughs> okay. anniversary of Racine. And the timing was perfect. Here I had this show, and everybody was thinking history. And I, I do slideshows all over the city, somewhat like what's going on now with, with Jim Mercier and, and uh, right. Carol. Yeah. You know? And they'll, be, they'll be in here next week. Yeah. And, and the thing is that, see, I only had a slide projector and a screen. Now we have all these different things. You know, you got PowerPoint, you got all the different things, which makes it so much easier, you know, and that. And so I, I hit it at the right time, uh, you know, because it was just everybody was thinking history at that time. You know, one of the other things I was thinking of is how did I actually get started in thinking of history? And that happened in the fourth grade at Garfield School. A man, a gentleman, an old teacher called Pop Sanders substituted in our class, and the whole day was spent on local history. He, and it was fascinating. This old man was up there telling us things that we never dreamed of. And and the other thing was in 1956, Jerry, the Journal Jerry, Times. Jerry, hold on there. 1956 is what we're going to pick up on in just a few okay. moments. Hold on. 729 at WRJN Radio, a civic media station, hometown radio. Refreshed. More with Jerry from Oak Clearing Farm in Union Grove coming up in just a moment. Stay where you are. Seven thirty-five. I'm Don Rosen, WRJN Radio. We're very lucky to have our special guest Jerry Karwowski here from Oak Clearing Farm in Union Grove. He's got the history of Racine located right at his farm, and I, we left off at what 1956. I forgot what year it was. We left off at yeah, 1956. Okay, go ahead. You were saying something. Well, in 1956, the Journal Times was celebrating their hundredth anniversary. And they had special editions every week in their Sunday Bulletin, just loaded with local history all the way back and continuing on. And uh, one of the things is they, they published it in book form. It was so popular that they took them newspaper issues and published them in, in a book form. And I had gotten one from the uh, Uptown Public Library. That's history now, too, the public library in, in Uptown. And she says, well, I'm not supposed to let it out. But for you, I'm going to let it out. So she, she made it a special thing that I could take the book out. And that and it was just fascinating. I was More and more local history was just, just pouring out of it. It was, it was just wonderful. You know, getting back to you doing these programs now, Back back years ago, I would come in and do programs with Bob Cook. This is ancient history. I, rem- I remember Bouton. Yeah, Frenchy Bob. I remember. I worked yeah. here with both guys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I was doing this is forty years ago. I was doing a, a, occasional programs on local history back then, forty years ago. You know, so I've been in this a long time. Yeah. 
Now, here's a, this, this question may sound kind of odd and off-putting, but what happens someday when you're not around to all this stuff you gathered and curated? What, what happens to it all? Okay, because it's a private collection owned by me and my, but owned by me, right. you know. Uh, we have a family trust that everything goes to my children, and I have, I have three daughters, and uh, good, two good, of them are good. extremely interested in, in, in the, the artifacts and the different things. And we're not talking about a few artifacts here, Don. I have probably 100,000 items here. Now, that, that isn't all hard, you know, artifacts, but postcards, when you add up the postcards, the photographs, all, all the other different things, the books and documents and everything, there's probably 100,000 pieces here. And, 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 you, uh, and your children will take care of it, right? They're going to be stuck with it. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've got boxes where this is not to be sold. I, I put tags in it. This is not to be sold because primarily them were gifts to me. I haven't been gifted a lot of things, but people have gifted me things. And with those types of things, especially when they're like a family collection of photographs and things, I put a note in that box that this is, you know, not to be sold. And that, that would be passed on to maybe Parkside uh, or the public library um, or something like that, you know. Well, you and know, was, I was on a much smaller scale. I have my dad's, From my dad was a uh, tail gunner for four years during World War II. He was a Navy tail gunner. And I have his dress uniform. I have all his medals. I have his commendations from the Navy from, the, uh, from World War II. I've got all that stuff. And what's going to happen when I'm not around anymore? Well, my nephew said to me, I want it. And so he's going to take it and hopefully leave it to someone else because I don't want them thrown in the garbage. My, my father's Navy dress uniform from World War II and all his medals and commendations, I don't want them thrown out. Also, I have the flag that they folded into a triangle. He have died with, uh, he was buried with uh, Navy honors. Something's got to be happening to this stuff. Like you, you, you've got to put it in the trust and leave it for somebody because you don't want this stuff being thrown in the garbage. It's history. And it's got to uh, be saved. You know, I work, I work uh, for the village of Yorkville Recycling and Collection Center uh, where they can bring their garbage and things, and you would be amazed at what people throw away. But me being there, and they know my interest in local history and preserving things, most of the people just hand it up to me. You have any use for this, Jerry? Or I hope, I hope this is something you, that you would want, you know? And it happens all the time, and and then it's it, it's really nice. And you know, I've got family histories. The the, the I've got boxes with their their birth certificates, their pictures, their their graduation certificates, and that. And they had no children, no children at all. Yeah, I know. And I'm the keeper of the flame for them. You know, I found I found a whole bunch of yearbooks, high school yearbooks in a trash can once. Uh, I forget where I was, where I found it. I didn't go dumpster diving, but I found it. And I called the high school in Illinois, and they said, we would love to have that, because we don't have that year. It was from the mid or early 1900s. We don't have that year. So I, I sent it to them, and they were very grateful, sent me a very nice letter back, saying it's a nice addition to their library. Somebody tossed it. I guess somebody passed away, and they tossed it. And along with all the tax returns from this person, but the yearbooks were valuable to somebody, and it was just happened to be in the garbage pail. And I forget where yeah. I found it. Hey, Jerry, I need you need to talk about American Pickers. I got to get that into the TV show. American Pickers <laughs> came to your farm to do a pick. Tell us okay. about that whole process. I got to tell you, every ever since they started, I got a phone call, and I talked to a producer. And almost every time, they say, oh, yeah, that's real interesting. Uh, we may call you back. <laughs> and then they never call back. And, and this went on for years. And my, my daughter said to me, she said, the next time you're in the area, don't you answer the phone. 
you let me deal with this because you talk them right out of it. <laughs> yeah. So I turned around, oh, okay, I won't answer the phone. And then I did get a couple phone calls, you know, and I didn't answer the phone. But what she did is she had some of her friends call them and say, hey, you know about that guy Jerry out there in Union Grove? You know? Oh, yeah, yeah, we heard something about it. And then she called in and, and said, uh, you know, you ever see Jerry out there in Union Grove? He's got a real nice collection of stuff. And, and uh, they said, oh, yeah, we, we heard about it. Well, I can answer any of your questions. I'm his daughter, you know. And, and so she worked four months, four months with producers and that. And, and then finally they told me that they wanted to Skype with me, you know. And I told her, no, I don't even want to deal with them people. I don't want nothing to do with it. I, I've had enough, you know. She says, Dad, they want to really talk to you. Oh, I don't want nothing to do it. And then she stormed out of here because I wasn't going along with what she wanted. My other daughter called up and, Dad, they really want to talk to you. Can't you just take a few minutes and talk to them? Yeah, okay. You know, so we get on Skype, and it's the same thing, talking to a producer. And uh, she said the same thing, that it sounds very interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look and give you a call, you know. And then they were putting the, the webcam away, and the phone rang. American Pickers. <laughs> and the producer is, uh, you know, telling me, will you be home tomorrow? This was on a Thursday, and they came on a Friday. Will you be home tomorrow at 10 o'clock? I says, I can be. And uh, how many people would be there? If there's a crowd of people there, we're going to turn around and drive back out, you know, and that don't clean anything, don't, don't move anything out that you'd think they'd want to see. They like to just go around with their flashlights and, and look at things. So, you know, then I, you know, go to bed next morning. I'm sitting here just like this morning looking at the clock, 7 o'clock, you know. I'm looking down the driveway, and all of a sudden trucks start coming in. And that, and I said, oh, my God, it wasn't a dream, you know. So the producers came around and looked around and that and opened this door, opened that door, and that type of thing. And that I wasn't directed to say anything except when they came up to the blacksmith shop, I was supposed to come out and say hi. And honest to God, I screwed that up. They had a dub. <laughs> you had one word and you screwed that up. <laughs> yeah, well, really, because they said, Dan did Danielle talk to you? And in that few seconds, I'm thinking, Dan I didn't talk to Danielle, you know? And and I was blank, and then, so they had a... <laughs> They had to dub that in, you know. It was kind of neat. One but I word. One they word. They didn't tell me remember. anything. Nothing was staged at all. <laughs> yeah. Not a thing. So how long did it take them to uh, pick and film and do all that kind of stuff? Nine hours. Now, they were here for nine hours. Now, I remember when I went through uh, your farm, I remember you saying, or somebody told me that they buy stuff for themselves and they buy stuff for the show. It's done separately, right? Absolutely. So how does Absolutely. that how does that work? Okay, uh, they 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 separated. Everything was uh, <clears throat> they knew exactly what they were going to put on the show when they left here because they were they were watching it on monitors and everything the whole thing and deciding what parts are better than the other parts and this and that. But there were you know Frank bought a number of toys uh, that weren't on the program. Mike bought a number of things, too, also, that weren't on the program for their self. Now, these guys got it made. They got it made. They got, a, they got a company that pays them to go around and do this, and, and then they got first pick, and they can make these side deals and buy stuff for their self. I mean, it's a, it's a win-win situation. You know, when American Pickers first came out, I'm at, the, I'm at the dump there, the, the collection site, and the guys were joking like the Dickens about, you got it better than they do. The stuff just comes to you. 
you don't even have to go out and look for it. You know? now, what, what kind of truck do they have to haul this stuff away? The uh, the American Pickers truck you see on the program. They got it all fit in there, huh? Well, they didn't buy anything real big. Okay. You know, uh, if if they bought a boat or something like that, then they have a box truck or a semi come for it. But all the things they bought for me, uh, they could get on that truck. Now, they didn't... bought some bicycles. Uh, I only have one regret. I have one regret. Uh, well, actually two, but the major regret was I sold them something that I shouldn't have sold oh. because it was a really good Racine artifact, and it was a salesman sample for teleoptic lights in Racine. Oh. And uh, I threw out a big number, and he kind of laughed about it, but he ended up paying $575. Whoa. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But you know what? If I went to an antique shop uh, up in Oshkosh and that was there, I'd pay a thousand for it. You know, yeah. I made a big mistake. But you know, all the excitement. I mean, you know, I'm going to be on a TV show and all of that. You get all excited. Did they have? A, but, did they have a food truck there? No. Oh, okay. They uh, they turned around and they said, "Where can we order good food?" They no longer went to restaurants because they couldn't eat their meal. Yeah, people come you up know? to them, yeah. Yeah, and they, initially when they first started, they go to a restaurant with people on the break or whatever. Here, we ordered from Route 20. Oh, yeah, and, right there uh, on Highway 20, yeah, okay. Yeah, and they told Route 20 to keep it all secret, don't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. It, Hold on a second, uh, Jerry. Jerry Kowalski from Oak Clearing Farm is with us. And I'm going to ask him when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit about more about American Pickers, but I'm going to ask him when you can go visit the farm. It's open only, I think, twice a year. We'll talk to Jerry about that. From Oak Clearing Farm, plus, in case you missed the title of that book that he's got that my wife wants to get, uh, we're going to repeat that for you, too. It's 749 at WRJN Radio, where hometown radio refreshed a civic media station. from Oak Clearing Farm in Union Grove. And let's finish up with American Pickers here real quickly. Now, when you saw the show, they were there for nine hours. And how long was your segment on the uh, show on TV? 30 minutes with, <laughs> with uh, advertisements. Did they get you saying the word hi? <laughs> they dubbed that in. <laughs> 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 One word! <laughs> yeah. I, I messed it up, that's for sure. <laughs> that was great. It was a fun time, I want to tell you. You know, uh, Mike Wolf, he, you know, in the breaks, he come in my living room, kicked back in the recliner, and it was just like I knew him for 100 years, like I knew him all my life. He is he's so personable. Frank, you know, he was fine. But he, he would, uh, instead of kicking back and talking, he'd wander off. He, he was always looking at things, you know, he went in the blacksmith shop and he'd be looking around in there rather than being real social. But Mike, my God, he was a social butterfly. He had just yeah, unbelievable. We laugh and, and carry on, and it was a real good time, you know. Did those guys have a falling out? I think so. Uh, I, yeah, I believe so, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, there's all kinds of stories of my, what might have happened or, you know, illnesses and things like that. Yeah. Uh, all right. You don't know. They don't, they don't give you the whole story. Yeah, but, and, uh, and you're not there to get the whole story. You're there <laughs> to, to help them out. Hey, um, I got I to ask you, we, we took a tour. We take a lot of cemetery tours, my wife and I, because there's so much history in a cemetery. A lot of people don't think, they just think of dead bodies in there, but there's history there. And we went oh, on, yeah. And just recently, a couple of months ago, we went to the Yorkville Cemetery, and you were there helping oh, give yeah. the tour. Yeah. I was Samuel Skewis, a prominent farmer out here in, in the Yorkville area. I was all decked out with my tuxedo and top hat. 
you know, I, I, I had to be the uh, acting or the uh, the president of the old Settler Society for the 150th anniversary of Union Grove. So they, I needed an outfit. So I went and bought an old tuxedo and, and a top hat and that. And uh, that's what I wore at the, the cemetery walk. And occasionally I'll put that on and people look at me like, who's this crazy guy? But it's, it's real historical looking. You and, know? Yeah, and let me tell you something. We, we, we walk through cemeteries all across the country. And my wife does a little research before we go there to these cemeteries. There's a cemetery just outside Metropolis, Illinois, at the bottom of the state. It's an old dilapidated cemetery. And in that cemetery is the gravesite of uh, Robert Stroud. You know who Robert Stroud is? No. No, a lot of people don't know him by that name. He was the Birdman of Alcatraz. Okay. Robert Stratt, he's buried there next to his mother in this old dilapidated cemetery. Unless you looked it up and knew it, you wouldn't know it. Then there's a cemetery in Lincoln, Nebraska, and a guy named Charles Starkweather is buried there. There were three movies made about him. One was called Natural Born Killers. Uh, one was called California with Brad Pitt. And the other one was called Badlands with Sissy Spacek and Martin Sheen. He was a uh, killer, serial killer. Him and his teenage girlfriend just went around killing people around Kansas and uh, Nebraska, I should say, Nebraska. And he's buried there in that cemetery. And right across from him are three of his victims facing him. <laughs> I'm, you don't, you, and there's so much, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you go to Mount Carmel Cemetery in Illinois, that's where Al Capone and a lot of the mobsters are buried. There's a story there I'll tell sometime about this woman who passed away in 1900. It's an amazing story. But it, there's so much to be found in cemeteries, and with that Yorkville Cemetery was a wonderful tour. I took, and you got to go to the house across the street, which oh, yeah. was part of the Royal tour. House. Yeah, beautiful so, restoration. Now, do you do that every year, or is it just this? Just no. Is, that that was a uh, well. They did a Yorkville or uh, Union Grove Cemetery where you're going to be. They did one a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, I went to that. I went to that one. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, and then uh, they did this one. Uh, we have other cemeteries in the area that they could do, like Sylvania Cemetery out there on the frontage road and things like that in the future, because that's in Yorkville also. In Yorkville, we have the history seekers, Union Grove and Yorkville. Uh, we have the history seekers, and and they're trying to interact with people and doing programs and, and things for the community related to local history. And a lot of the members are, are volunteers here at, 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 at Oak Clearings. I am so fortunate over the years, I've had uh, a, a wonderful group of volunteers. And I mean, these people go out of their way and they do a great job. You know, when you got people that work together as a team and to get things done, you can really accomplish nice things. It isn't just me, you know, I, I you know, I did the, painting and the building and and moving and decorating but they bring it to life you know, you know I, they wear these outfits and that and they bring it to life and that is so cool you know i got to notice here from ron helmick he said uh, frank lamping uh died from crohn's disease i guess that's what he got sick from and uh, oh, frank fritz frank fritz oh frank fritz okay yeah okay frank fritz, from american I'm sorry. pickers Oh, okay. oh, that's who he's talking about. Okay, Frank that's Fritz. That's who he's talking about. Got Crohn's yeah. disease. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I, I got it mixed up there. You just said Packer Frank. Packer Frank with yeah. uh, cancer. Yeah, okay. That, that's, cancer got him. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, mis I misunderstood the read. Yeah. That's why I hate text messaging, because I, the, you can get things misconstrued. Um, also, my wife said the reason we took those plots in Union Grove was because of that History Seekers event we went to. And that's right. Because her dad is buried there. Her mom and dad are buried there. But we went to the History Seekers event at Union Grove uh, Memorial Cemetery. And that's the day we decided to uh, kind of move in. <laughs> I hate to okay. say, it, say it that way. You know, we have four plus. My brother and his wife are going to be buried there as well. And I one day wanted to, you know, it's a, you, it's a real estate deal when you buy a cemetery plot. That's basically what it is. And I wanted to have a picnic on there. Just put a sign, Future Home of. Don Rosen, you know, <laughs> right on the play. Hey, get, uh, Jerry, give us the name of the book one more time. Uh, Through the Eyes of Wilfred Marshall. And it's available at the Art 
Artist Gallery, Artist Fourth and Gallery. Main, Fourth and Main, downtown Racine. Yeah, and my other book, Racine, the Postcards book, that's at Barnes and Noble. Okay. That one, I'm, I want to tell you something. In, in 2000, well, I went to Kenosha, the museum, historical museum in get, Kenosha. Kenosha is fabulous. Gotta, you're gonna have to save that for next time. We're out of time. Oh, geez. Jerry Karwowski, save it for next time because I'll have you back, Jerry. No problem. Oak Clearings Farm in Union Grove, and what are the two times people can come there? Real quick. Uh, spring and fall. Father's Day. Father's Day is going to be the spring one. Okay, good. Looking forward to that, Jerry. I'll have you back just before that to remind people. Okay. I'm Don right. Rosen. Uh, Jerry, hold on the line. Don't go anywhere. WRJN Radio, hometown radio.